invite you to turn in your Bibles to uh, Revelation chapter 4. Uh, we are studying the character and attributes of God, and uh, we've been learning lots of stuff so far. We started off with the fatherhood of God. We see all the other attributes of God in light of the fact that He is our Father. Uh, we looked at the fact that God is all-knowing and all-powerful and everywhere present, and what that means to us. We looked at God's sovereignty, the fact that he is the king of the universe, but yet how that intercorrelates with the freedom that he gives us as human beings, and uh, that's a very weighty subject, and we plowed through that and tried to get a level of understanding about God's sovereignty and, and freedom. And then uh, we had these uh, words that we worked through uh, last week, right? Remember, we talked about the fact that God is not just a God of kindness and love and grace and mercy, but the Bible reveals these other qualities that kind of go along with them, right? The sternness, the discipline, the wrath, and the judgment, right? He's, I said God is not Santa Claus. And no offense against Santa Claus, right, Denise? Right? <laughs> so no offense against Santa Claus, because we like St. Nicholas. He's a cool guy. But, uh, but God is not Santa Claus, right? So do you remember this? You get a star for today. If you remember, what's the most important word up here? And, right? Because he's not just a God of the things that are left. He's a God of kindness and sternness, a God of love and discipline, a God of love, a God of grace and wrath, and a God of mercy and judgment. Remember we said uh, we're really thankful that our God is not described by just the words on the right side, right? That would be the God of Islam. God of sternness, discipline, wrath, and judgment. That's not our God, because our God is a God of kindness and love and grace and mercy. But he is also these other things, and we have to understand how they come together. That's why the most important word was and, and you missed that last week if you missed it, okay? So, uh, this week we get to a subject that's vitally important uh, as we try to learn more and more about God and, and get to know Him in a way that is proper according to the scriptures, we come to this subject about God's holiness. God's holiness. An extremely important uh, thing for us to understand, uh, especially in our culture, which so wants to bring God down to our level, but yet the, the truth of who God reveals Himself in uh, as in His holiness it's not about bringing God down to our level, okay, because we, yeah, we would do wrong to try to bring God down to our level. Okay, so we need to understand God's holiness. Uh, I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 4 and verses 1 through 11 uh, to start off with, okay? After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had uh, first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven, with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald, encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures gave glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, and who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fell down before him who sits on the throne, and worship him who lives forever and ever. 
They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So I'd like to start off with a question. Okay, notice as I read that passage, uh, I don't know if this stood out to you or not, but did you notice there in, uh, in verse uh, 8 it is, where these uh, living creatures were saying day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So we're talking about God's holiness, right? So uh, here's the question. Why three times? Why three times? You know, because we've talked about a lot of God's attributes over the last several weeks, right? We just listed them there just before as I got started. God's attributes. But here we see these beings in heaven, and they say, holy, holy, holy. So that's interesting, isn't it? You know, that they would say this three times. You know, why is it that there's no other attributes of God that are spoken of in this way? Like, because this passage doesn't say, love, 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 or grace, grace, grace. Now, is God's love unimportant? No. Is God's grace unimportant? No. See, but there's something about this holiness of God that is something beyond probably our understanding in this flesh. That these beings need to say over and over again, <coughs> holy, holy, holy. I'll give you a little definition here from a, a, my uh, Bible study encyclopedia. It says, God's holiness depicts the moral purity and excellence of God. God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit can all be described with these words. Holy, blameless, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. The root idea of holiness is to be separate or set apart. Because of his holiness, God is distinct from everything impure or unholy. God alone is perfect in his holiness. And he is described with that uh, name hundreds and hundreds of times in Scripture. I'd like to uh, quote a little bit from a book uh, for you this morning. This is one of the books I have in my office. It's called The Knowledge of the Holy. Uh, there is just tons of books written about this subject because it is such an essential thing for us to understand. And uh, I thought it was pertinent in today's world just to read uh, part of the uh, preface of this book because I think it helps us to begin to get a grasp of just how important it is for us to see God as a God of holiness. So here's what it says. This is The Knowledge of the Holy, A.W. Tozer. It's a classic. Uh, he says, True religion confronts earth with heaven and brings eternity to bear upon time. The messenger of Christ, though he speaks from God, must also, as the Quakers used to say, speak to, con to the condition of his hearers. Otherwise, he will speak language known only to himself. His message must be not only timeless, but timely. He must speak to his own generation. The message of this book does not grow out of these times, but it is appropriate to them. It is called forth by a condition which has existed in the church for some years and is steadily growing worse. And this is where, just pay attention to what he's saying here because it's absolutely true. This is what's growing worse in our culture today. He says, I refer to the loss of the concept of the majesty of God from the popular religious mind. The church has surrendered her once lofty, lofty concept of God and has substituted it for one so low, so ignoble, as to be utterly unworthy of thinking, worshiping men. This she has done, not deliberately, but little by little and without her knowledge, and her very awareness, unawareness only makes her situation all the more tragic. The low view of God entertained almost universally amongst Christians is the cause of a hundred lesser evils everywhere among us. The whole new philosophy of the Christian life has resulted 
from this one basic error in our religious thinking. With our loss of the sense of majesty has come the further loss of religious awe and consciousness of the divine presence. We have lost our spirit of worship and our ability to withdraw inwardly to meet God in adoring silence. Modern Christianity is simply not producing the kind of Christian who can appreciate or experience life in the spirit. The words, be still and know that I am God, mean next to nothing to the self-confident, bustling worshiper. This loss of the concept of majesty has come just when the forces of religion are making dramatic gains and the churches are more prosperous than at any time within the past several hundred years. And I've heard a statistic where they said, the church of Jesus Christ today has more money at its disposal than all the people of all time combined up until the last 50 years of our time. You know, the amount of money that has come into the church in the last 50 years is more than all the money combined from all of human history up until that time. It's just like there's an amazing amount of wealth in the, in the church. But does that mean we're being successful at God's purposes for, as people? I, I think the author is suggesting something different. So he says, but the alarming thing is that our gains are mostly external and our losses wholly internal. And since it is the quality of our religion that is affected by internal conditions, it may be that our supposed gains are but losses spread over a wider field. The only way to recoup our spiritual losses is to go back to the cause of them and make such corrections as the truth warrants. And uh, listen carefully. He says, the decline of the knowledge of the holy has brought on all of our troubles. A rediscovery of the majesty of God will go a long way towards curing them. It is impossible to keep our moral practices sound and our inward attitudes right while our idea of God is erroneous or inadequate. If we would bring back spiritual power to our lives, we must begin to think of God more nearly as He is, in His majestic holiness. And so that's just a brief portion from, from that book. Okay, go back to Revelation chapter 4, and let me try to illustrate the point this way. Okay, go back again to, uh, to verse 8, and uh, just ponder and just sort of just think about what is communicated here in verse 8, right? Each of these four living creatures had six wings and, and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. And then this statement, day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. Now, here's the question. How long could you hang out in heaven, just in your way of thinking about it, just who we are right now in the world today? How long would you, like, be comfortable hanging out in heaven as this continued to go on? Okay? Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, and is, and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, and is, and is to come. Are you getting my point? Now think about that. Because it says, day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, either God is a whole lot more awesome and glorious and amazing than we could ever imagine, or God is really boring. <laughs> Which one do you think it is? You get my point? See, because if God right now just peeled back the veil that separates heaven from earth, and if we just had a one-tenth of one percent glimpse of the glory and majesty and holiness of God, nobody would be sitting down anymore. You'd all be crawling underneath the 
church pews because she wouldn't be able to stand it. The glory of God. Every time someone in the Bible, and there's a, 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 a passage that describes somebody encountering a heavenly being, whether it's God himself or an angelic being, what's the first thing they say? Do not fear. Why? Because the people were ducking for cover. When they encounter the awesome majesty and holiness of God, it's something so amazing that people don't even know what to do. And right now, even though it seems like it would be a really boring thing to us in our limited human way of thinking, but if right now you were in the presence of God, and you were going to continue to be in the presence of God for all of eternity, you would not be bored. Because God would be so awesome, so majestic, so glorious, that you would be glad to be hanging out in heaven in the presence of God forever, doing the same thing as these elders were, these beings, and saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Because if you were experiencing God in His holiness, you would never want to go anywhere else or do anything else except to be in that exact spot. That begins to just give us the slightest glimpse of what it means when we talk about the holiness of God. Do you think our culture and the average Christian really appreciates God and relates to God with that view of Him much these days? I think the author of this book hit it right on where he talks about the fact that we have lost this in the modern Christian world. This idea of the holiness of God. We should be like these other creatures here, right? It says in verses 9 and following, whenever these living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him. That's where we belong. They fall be down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. I would have to say that we all probably have room to grow in our appreciation and adoration to God's holiness. Would you agree? Yes. Yes. Okay. Just making sure you're still awake there. <laughs> so let me let me turn to uh, a couple more passages of Scripture, okay, because, uh, and look at God's holiness in a couple other places, and then I'm going to uh, answer the so what question, okay? Okay. So uh, first of all, go back to Isaiah chapter 6. And uh, because there is such a vacuum of a proper understanding of this, I want to give you as much scripture as possible so that hopefully uh, by reading these scriptures we gain a, a better appreciation for what this means about God's holiness. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, there it is again, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the door close to the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Notice Isaiah's response. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. You think you can relate with Isaiah? Hmm. I think we'd be in the same spot, you know? Uh, Hebrews chapter 7. And verse 26 talking about uh, Jesus uh, in the book of Hebrews, and it says, Such a high priest meets our need, 
the one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. That gives us a good little snapshot just of the definition of what God's holiness means. So let, you know, I could go to literally hundreds upon hundreds of other passages describing God's holiness, uh, but I want to more focus on the so what question, right? So, so what? Right? God's holiness, so what? What does that mean for the Christian? Well, I believe I would answer this way. The fact that we were created also to reflect God's character of holiness in our own lives. The scripture is full of this, right? So, <clears throat> let's talk about our holiness. We've talked about God's holiness. And we've seen that, you know, just a glimpse of that would cause us to, uh, to just fall down before God in worship. And uh, the question, though, is what kind of effect does that have on us? What does God expect of us? If God is this awesome and holy and majestic, does he really expect us to be holy, too? What do you think the answer is? Yes. Yeah, he does. Like, it's just crazy to think about it. But God actually calls us over and over in a bunch of scriptures, and I'm going to give you all these right here this morning, okay? God actually calls us to live a life of holiness. Okay, go to Ephesians chapter 4. And the reason why I'm, like I do, overproving my point is because there's such a dearth of a lack of emphasis on this in these days. You know, in the modern church today, the emphasis on whatever makes me feel good. When we talk about God's holiness, it's not about what makes you feel good. but what It's about what makes you good. It's God's holiness. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. So I tell you all this, and it, it finishes up about God's holiness, right? But you have to see it in the context. This is the kind of life that God calls us to, which is a life of holiness. Verse 17. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. This is describing our culture. They are darkened in their understanding and separate from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Does that describe our culture? Yeah, I think so. But what about Christians? Verse 20. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That is the calling of the Christian life, to be to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 8. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. The word sanctified is very closely related to the word holiness. The idea of being set apart, especially for God, is the idea of being sanctified. So it's God's will that you should be sanctified. That you should avoid sexual immorality that each one of you should learn to control his own body. Now that's a crazy idea in today's culture, isn't it? Hmm. This, this crazy Bible, it's just like, you know, where did this come from? God? <laughs> that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen that are on TV every night of the week. Hmm. The heathen that do not know God, you know some adding in little stuff into the Bible, right? <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> like the heathen who did not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins, as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to live, to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, who rejects, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives you his holy Spirit. Notice again the idea of holiness for us, but
But then, notice the idea how it's brought in with from God, who gives you His Holy Spirit. Okay, that's really important. Okay, now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and here what you need to see is, okay, uh, I know it seems crazy for God to expect us to be holy people, right? But the reason why it's possible is because God Himself, God the Holy Spirit, comes to live inside of me. There is no way that I can be holy by the power of my flesh. The only way that I can be holy is because the Holy Spirit of God lives within me, and if I allow the Holy Spirit of God to control me, then I become holy because it's the Holy Spirit living in me and living through me and out of me. Okay, this is exactly what Paul talks about in Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? That's how it's possible for you to be holy, right? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. That's how you can be holy. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. <coughs> Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received of God, you are not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. Holiness. That's what God expects from us because the Holy Spirit of God lives within us. 2 Peter chapter 3. <coughs> 2 Peter chapter 3 beginning in verse 10. Describes some very fearful days to us and some things that are scary. <coughs> but again, we have to understand the holiness of God. It says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Good question, right? What do you think the Apostle Peter is going to say as an answer? Oh, you should just be cool and hang out and just do like the rest of the world does, right? Mm. Like, yeah, you know, God, yeah, you know, live your life for you, just sprinkle a little bit of Jesus on top and everything's going to be okay, right? <laughs> say no. No. Okay. <laughs> Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt into heat. But in keeping with his promises, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. God is preparing us for that home. That's why he wants us to be holy right here and right now so that we can come to this home of righteousness. So he says in verse 14 then, So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. See, God calls us to be holy. Now, I'm not perfect yet. How about you? So this is a scary thought, isn't it? It says there, though, the Lord's patience. You see? God is patient. But that doesn't mean we can shake our fist into the grace of God and say, I'm going to continue to live in sin no matter what. God calls us to holiness. So he says, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. I'd say it's good advice for Christians in these days. Hebrews chapter 12. <coughs> Verses 14 and 15. Here it is again. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now there's a scary statement. Wow. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. You think holiness might be important? 
say, nah, that's old fashioned. Forget about the holiness. Because my Bible says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Anybody here want to see the Lord? You, you want to be in heaven someday? You need holiness. <laughs> well, you ain't getting there. Nothing unholy is entering into heaven. Nothing. God is purifying his bride. He is making her holy. I read that yesterday at Christopher's wedding. Okay. Where am I at? Hebrews chapter 12. Okay. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 next. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm reading you all these scriptures because I want you to make sure and like as you talk to your friends and family about this, this isn't just an isolated verse like one verse in all the scripture that talks about being holy. Right? I want you to see it's all over the place. 1 Peter 1, verses 13 through 17. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. And since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. Reverent fear. That's going to be my topic next week, okay? Just a little advanced advertisement, right? Next week, because this is such a big topic all in and of itself, next week we're going to talk about the fear of the Lord. It's very much coupled together with holiness of God. But th this week I'm trying to, I'm giving you all the holiness, right? And then next week we're going to really zero in on what the Bible talks about, the appropriate response to a God of holiness, and by a life of holiness, is this concept called the fear of the Lord. It's such a grossly misunderstood thing in our modern American, supposedly Christian culture. Right? A gross misunderstanding of what it means to fear the Lord. So next week, that's next week, okay, the fear of the Lord. But just a snippet of it right there uh, in the book of uh, Peter, right? Live your lives here as strangers here in reverent fear. Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, again is another heavenly scene. Verse 1 says, and I, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and standing before the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image, and over the number of his name, they held harps given them by God, and sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And finally, Psalm 29, and verse 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for the word of God, which gives us accurate and true description of who you are. Father, we have been learning about your character and about your attributes, trying to understand who you are and know you better, Father, so that we might worthily magnify and worship your name. Father, we see that in your holy scriptures, you reveal your holiness, <clears throat> the fact that you are above all, that you are perfectly pure, that you are beyond any form of sin. Father, we also see that in your scriptures, you call us as followers of Christ to 
also live holy lives. Father, we recognize the fact that that is impossible by the power of our flesh, but that it is very possible when we allow your Holy Spirit to have control of our lives. Father, I pray that we would give that control over, that we would surrender our tendency to want to control our own destiny, to chart our own course, to create our own religion according to our lights and according to our comforts. Father, I pray that we might get a new vision of your holiness, just like these beings in heaven that worship you night and day, forever and ever, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Father, help us to appreciate anew just what that means and treat you in a manner worthy of that holiness. Help us, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit to fulfill that calling upon our lives so that we might escape these flames of judgment so that we might experience the grandeur of your holiness for all of eternity. Thank you, Father, for what you will do with us. We pray in Jesus' precious name.